My name is Hiroshi Ono. I'm from Hitotsubashi University in Japan. I'm a professor of human resource management and international business. Um, and I'm here at the IPSB um, Chapter 8, Social Justice and Well-Being. And I believe it's because of my research related to happiness. I'm a lead author, uh, and I believe I'm supposed to be uh, discussing issues of social justice and happiness. I think that uh, it's a very broad topic, social justice and well-being, and so currently we're having discussions about definitions. I mean, many different conceptions of social justice, uh, and empirically there are so many different ways to measure well-being. Um, but hopefully uh, we're trying to come up with ways of, like, um, has there, I mean, looking back historically, have we achieved um, social justice? Um, has capitalism uh, paved the way towards social justice? Um, and are there alternative ways of capitalism uh, that we can look into which would improve our well being? Um, so, hopefully, well, today is Friday, but by the end of the day tomorrow, we would like to have some kind of a working draft or a working outline of how these things can be achieved. Um, personally, um, there, uh, since my area is in discussing well-being, so one of the uh, issues that um, the study of well-being has come to so much attention is because historically we've only been looking at objective forms of well-being. You know, such as money and wealth and income, uh, but those are not necessarily very good measures of um, a country's performance. Um, and there are other alternative measures like quality of life, uh, namely like subjective well-being. So I think the field is moving from objective to subjective well-being as um, measures of possible outcomes. Um, but we do have an empirical issue because um, subjective well-being is, by definition, very subjective, and so it could be open to like judgment. And if you try to measure issues like values um, and happiness and satisfaction, these can be very like subjective, if um, and not very dif empirically defined. So we do have some challenges, but um, I'm hoping that we can steer the debate in that direction. In my area of, well, maybe I'll just talk about the happiness research that I've done, because I'm currently writing a book on that subject. Um, so if you look at, uh, like, it's because my field is sociology. You know, there's happiness is a very interdisciplinary approach. So you can have economics, sociology, psychology, political science, uh, history, anthropology. Different disciplines have different ways of looking at happiness. And I would say, to to be fair, I think the psychologists deserve a great deal of credit for pioneering the area of happiness. Um, but uh, economists and, and sociologists have been made their own contribution. And in my area, which I call sociology of happiness, there's like two ways of looking at it. Um, like psychologists and economists, they look for like universal models of happiness. So like what makes people happy in one context is basically universal. Right? It doesn't matter if you live in Turkey, U.S., Japan, Africa, I mean, th the same things that make people happy in one country are very much universal, whereas sociologists, the context is very important. So there's an individual, but the individual is always situated in society, so there's individual levels of happiness, and then there's like social um, determinants, if not constraints on happiness, right? So, yes, happiness depends on the social context. So having said that, you know, we look at like both like individual and um, societal level determinants of happiness. 
and what we discovered, first of all, at the country level is like you can look at these cross-country variations in happiness and you see extremely, uh, yeah, by and large, you, you see like the Scandinavian welfare states have uh, pretty high levels of happiness. Um, U.S. is something in between. And then you have at the very bottom, you have the post-communist countries, right? So these are you know, the countries that have made the transition um, from capital uh, from some, from communism to capitalism, and like these are very very sad places in terms of happiness. They're at the bottom of the happiness rankings, and we're trying to figure out why that is. So um, coming back to the um, trying to link this with the IPSP, I think that the um, you know it kind of um, makes us question our, our assumptions um, that, first of all, what's interesting is that a lot of these people um, were actually happy under communism. Right? So in terms of well-being um, and happiness, communism was not a failure. It's very strange, perhaps, surprising. Um, and like over time, what we discovered is that you know after the transition to capitalism, people's happiness actually plummeted, right? And so, um, contrary to many people's assumptions, the you know uh, it's not like capitalism is the liberation towards um, I mean towards happiness. And so the question is like, what went wrong, right? Um, and that's where we still do not have much research, but what little we know is that, you know, there was like a, um, I think that people had extremely high expectations towards capitalism, um, that this transition from like a state-run economy to a market-based economy, uh, people had very high expectations, uh, like a merit-based economy, but that transition did not go well. Um, there was widespread corruption, um, <clears throat> organized crime, and so the institutions were not in place to pave the way towards uh, well-functioned markets. Um, and overall, people felt like a sense of powerlessness. You know, um, one of the countries that I study is Bulgaria, and um, Bulgaria was one of those countries that was doing pretty well under communism. And then once the uh, wall came down, um, Bulgaria uh, started their path towards capitalism, and eventually they joined the EU. But now they're like the, the lowest performing country in the EU. And so when I went to Bulgaria and I talked to some people there, you know, they have a, this identity crisis. You know, so they're like this elite under communism, but they're like the, um, the worst performing country under the EU. So there's a little bit of an identity crisis, and um, it's not a, like an inferiority uh, complex. And this has affected people, you know, across all demographic groups. The old people look back at communism, and they, you know, they, they're nostalgic. You know, things were better back then. Um, and the young people uh, see no hope in the country, and they leave. So. Like in the case of Bulgaria, they've had like this massive population um, exodus, especially among the young people, like a big brain drain. I think they lost like two million people uh, after the transition. And it seems like this is a continuing trend. So um, we see that, you know, in terms of this um, transition, um, hasn't necessarily gone well, and that we need to uh, reassess the, you know, our conventional views and assumptions that um, capitalism is not, you know, in its current state, the, a panacea towards better quality of life. I'm one of those um, people that have spent time in three different countries. Um, my first job out out of um, graduate school was in Sweden, 
and I spent eight years there, and then um, and then I spent eight years in the United States, being a faculty member, and then I'm currently in Japan, and so I've had, you know, I've experienced three different um, <coughs> uh, what what S. Bing Anderson would call like the three varieties of capitalism, actually. Yeah, the social democratic welfare state, the market state, and the conservative state, where you know there's um, the family is like the locus of control. And I'm not going to take sides of you know which one is better, but I think the um, the the one thing that I did experience in the United States is that you know there's uh, the inequality is out of control. Yes, and there has to be some kind of a redistributive mechanism. Markets are definitely not the solution. Um, and you know, trying to pinpoint the government as the problem is incorrect. Um, <clears throat> and so, yes, I think that uh, there is some role for the state to play. Um, and of course, we always come back to this debate about what is the optimal balance between market and state. But I think the uh, in the in the case of the United States, it's a little too much market. Um, and I think that the state has some role to play. Um, the concentration of you know wealth um, is something that has to be rectified, and the market is not going to be the solution for that.